Hello, my name is Marcus Bühler and I serve as the section editor for the new MRS Bulletin Impact section that publishes original research. I'm very pleased today to be talking with Professor Julia Greer, the Ruben and Donna Medler Professor of Material Science, Mechanics and Medical Engineering at Caltech. Julia is also the director of the Kavli Nanoscience Institute and has long been associated with MRS. Today we'll be discussing work that Professor Greer and colleagues have recently published in MRS Bulletin Impact titled from ion to atom to dendrite, formation and nanomechanical behavior of electrodeposited lithium. On behalf of MRS, I would like to thank you, Julia, for contributing to IMPACT. Uh, your article has seen its first citation already, and your paper is in fact the very first paper that we have published in IMPACT. We are very excited about the opportunity to learn more from you today. Uh, Julia, uh, thank you for talking with us, and I have a bunch of questions that I'd like to ask you today. Thank you very much for this introduction, uh, Marcus. This is, this is exciting in, uh, in every way, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Great. So um, high energy density solid state batteries are becoming ubiquitous in many technologies around the world and may well be a cornerstone of mobility technologies in, in the future, um, especially if we can go beyond the specific energy density of current limits of graphitic anodes. Can you explain in broad terms what your work is about and the specific findings and what issue they address? Absolutely. The point you bring up is so important. Um, I think our whole world is trying to address the climate change and shift towards uh, 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 removing our reliance on fossil fuels and developing batteries, of course, is a key part of that uh, development. So we, of course, being the fundamental research um, academic lab, are able to start understanding these kinds of problems and current existing limitations at the very fundamental scientific level. So what the specific problem we um, embarked on in this work is trying to understand the formation of lithium dendrites during the cycling that is charging and discharging of lithium ion batteries. In this particular work, we were working with um, a solid state uh, battery. It's a thin film solid state battery. And what that means is that every component, including the electrolyte, was a solid. Now, this particular battery was lithium free to begin with. And that is that the anode was the electro deposited lithium itself. It didn't have graphitic anode, um, unlike some other uh, lithium ion batteries. Of course, lithium being a much higher energy material compared to graphitic uh, carbon or many other uh, materials. So there is a tremendous push to be able to use it in uh, real battery technologies. But uh, of course, it's a very unsafe metal to work with, so to speak, and so it, it requires special handling. So in this work, we are endeavoring to explain why some of the lithium um, anode-based metal, uh, based batteries fail um, in short circuit and sometimes um, go up in flames. Um, the main culprit of that technology has been this uncontrollable formation of lithium dendrites that grow from the anode to the cathode through the electrolyte and penetrate even the solid state electrolyte, which is a, which is a, a very surprising um, process for, for why they're not suppressed by the solid. Um, and then, of course, once the dendrite grows, it can short circuit the battery and it can set um, off a thermal, um, uh, thermal gradient, and that's what leads to fires. Uh, sometimes. So in our work, we aim to explain why, is, why it is possible for the dendrites to nucleate and to grow in the fashion that they do, and to provide guidance for how to suppress them. And so that's the exciting part, is that we now understand why the theory, the earlier theory, was not complete, and why they're able to penetrate through the solid, lithium, solid uh, state lithium-based electrolyte, um, and how we can suppress that. So we, we think that's a pretty exciting finding. Yeah, and that's very exciting. And you, you touched upon a, a very important part of the paper, and that is you have some really unique mechanistic insights, uh, especially relating to size effects. And I find it fascinating how you, I know you have worked on size effects for a long time and the mechanics of materials at different dimensions. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the mechanisms you've discovered and especially how you've been able to, I think in a really brilliant way in that paper, to connect nanoscience, mechanics, battery technology, um, really intertwining them and connecting them to solve this really important potentially societal problem of creating much higher capacity batteries. You ask such good questions, Marcus. It's a pleasure to answer them, how you link it all together. It is true that nanoscience prevails through, um, through all of it. And that's 
uh, th that is the, the key part of the findings. And that is that when you get down to these nanoscale dimensions, especially for metals, for all materials really, but especially in metals, um, there are unique mechanisms that have to do with defects that arise and they govern multiple uh, properties, including the mechanical properties. And so the fundamental um, genesis of the size effect is that most metals, when you reduce their dimensions to the uh, nano size, depending on the specific microstructure, that is the atomic level microstructure that uh, makes, makes up that metal, um, exhibit a so-called size effect. So they can be either stronger or weaker. Um, in this particular case, lithium being the body-centered cubic uh, metal in its single crystalline form, it turns out that all single crystalline metals, when you reduce their dimensions down to about a micron and below, exhibit enhanced amplified strengths to maybe an order of magnitude and sometimes higher. Um, um, and so that's what we demonstrated among other metals that exhibit these size effects. Lithium specifically um, demonstrates strengths that are a factor of 50 higher than one would expect. And in part, that is what was grossly underestimated before. So in the existing theory and then just earlier studies, the understanding of the strength of lithium was based on bulk properties, on, on the properties of bulk metals with grain boundaries, of course, polycrystalline metals, um, which are very soft. And so their stiffnesses and their yield strength were in the very low megapascal range. And what we're showing is that the, both the strength and the stiffness um, are actually quite a bit higher, can it, uh, attaining about 25 uh, megapascals and sometimes even greater when you get to the reduced dimensions of about 100 nanometers um, or so. Um, this has with the specific governing role that play in the mechanism of deformation of these um, of these materials, especially after yielding, especially the post-elastic uh, regime. So that's how the size effect manifests itself. And um, the lithium dendrites, when they first nucleate, are very much in that nano size regime. They uh, start maybe at, well, of course, the nuclei themselves are, are just a, a few atoms. And as they grow, they become uh, maybe 10 to 50 nanometers. And of course, uh, as the solid state diffusion of lithium proceeds, um, the diameter grows, but at those initial stages, the lithium dendrites are so much so in the nano size regime that their strength would be actually highest at the time when they're growing. And so that's uh, what, what allows the penetration to occur. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you, Julia. You've worked on the size effects um, for many, many years, actually, and you have some really amazing classic papers on nano pillars and the mechanics. Uh, and I was, I was curious, uh, and maybe our listeners are curious too, have how have your earlier studies and understanding of, of size effects in other materials informed this work and how were you able to connect these different disciplines so effectively in this paper i mean it's really a, an incredible feat you've accomplished here can you talk a little bit about how you did the research and maybe give some guidance to future generations of researchers and others that are interested in, in being able to creatively connect the different fields thank you yeah that's actually that's what's happening with our scientific world right now. It seems like everything is becoming interdisciplinary. The point you're, be, you're bringing up is so important. Um, we can't really approach science anymore in a narrow-minded sort of single lens on uh, perspective anymore. It's just there's too much intertwined phenomena. And the example you're bringing up is, is, a, is a testament to how interconnected everything is. So when I first started my career working on size effects, um, we were looking only at the mechanical properties of very conventional, well-understood metals like gold and then uh, copper and nickel. And then we shifted into the BCC world. Uh, we looked at some molybdenum and, and um, uh, tungsten, et cetera. But now that we're dealing with batteries or any kind of material development, or of course you work very much in the carbon uh, space, you start to recognize that when you get to these very small dimensions and functionality of materials, um, they need to function, but they also have to not break as they function. So even though the mechanical properties may not be their primary functionality, they very much depend on their mechanical resilience to be able to perform the function that they need in the particular device that they're serving. So in this case, the battery, um, of course it helped me uh, to have the intuition having worked on the, on the size effects in nano size 
uh, metals for a long time, it helped uh, to have that intuition that knowing that, well, lithium dendrites at the nanoscale, it sounds a little bit like a, a, that classical problem that we first tackled maybe about a decade or at least uh, actually now even more than a decade uh, ago. So when we started this work with the nanopillars, um, the nanopillars were produced using this carving technique, subtractive carving technique, where we used a focused ion beam to mill out uh, cylinders with the dimensions of um, just a few tens of nanometers or well, hundreds of nanometers. And then to assess their mechanical behavior, we compressed them so that they wouldn't buckle, but instead we would compress uh, them. And then eventually we developed the technique to also uh, study the same uh, types of materials under tension so we can understand their mechanical attributes like the stiffness, the yield strength, and a post-elastic deformation. So having this intuition that something interesting ought to happen in lithium, uh, being a representative of the, of the BCC metals, gave us insights for how to guide this research, even though it's battery related, there's still quite a bit of fundamental material science uh, left in it. And the technique that we used um, was actually a combination, just like you mentioned, of the nanopillar knowledge that we've gained throughout the years and understanding the electrochemical nature of how a battery cycles. So these uh, lithium dendrites are actually, we call them phantom samples because they don't exist before the experiment and they don't exist after the experiment. They are formed through electrochemical cycling in the instrument that also compresses them. So mm -hmm. what we put into our instrument is just a battery. It's just a thin film battery. And then we start cycling it. And then these dendrites grow, of course, through the electrolyte, through the from the cathode, through the electrolyte, um, through the current collector. And then they grow up. And as they're growing, uh, we select, they, they grow, of course, uncontrollably. So we have to wade through thousands of these nanodendrites that form to find ones that are oriented just right. And then we find, we say in the paper, of course, we just find, you know, some typical ones, but of course that means your best ones. <laughs> that, um, that we then uh, uh, bring into under the electron beam so that we can compress them and to ascertain their mechanical strength. But they were formed as a process of electrochemical cycling in that instrument. And the moment you open the chamber, they all oxidize and, and they don't exist anymore. So it's a very meta, <laughs> meta problem. That's amazing. <clears throat> yeah, very, very, very inspiring. Um, so if you look ahead, Julia, you and your team, um, what could be the next steps for either that you're doing right now and, uh, or maybe others could do? I mean, what are the open challenges and like the next frontier maybe in, in studying problems like this or maybe an extension of this particular problem? Yeah, gosh, there's so many. Um, there are so many problems that can now be uh, tackled either using similar uh, approaches or a similar line of thinking. Um, for our group specifically, we're very interested in developing solid state uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of sustainability. And, um, you know, in fact, I uh, recently bought my very first Tesla, uh, which I love. <laughs> um, and I would love to be able to decouple our world from fossil fuels as, as much as possible. So developing lightweight and safe and mechanically robust batteries is very high on my list, uh, both professionally um, and personally. So chipping away at these types of problems, what will enable us to get to that future where we can uh, build efficient batteries that are uh, resilient, that are safe, that are energy dense. Of course, the high energy density is a huge pursuit right now, right? And so it's a trade-off. It's always the trade-off between um, the main culprit, the electrolyte, the transport and the solvation mechanism of lithium uh, through the electrolyte, as well as the theoretical capacity on the anode um, and, and a little less on the cathode side, but certainly on the anode side. So what we're interested in is in creating three-dimensional solid state batteries so that you can decouple the transport uh, distance and um, uh, the, well, of course, the transport distance can be minimized in these and the um, mass loading. So if we could architect these electrodes, which is a, 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 another very uh, large area of research in my group is creating uh, nano and micro-architected materials. If we can use these nano-sized building blocks to construct three-dimensional networks, which can then serve as electrodes, uh, just like we discussed, the mechanical properties are, are a key player, but they're almost never the primary functionality. Um, so if we could utilize our knowledge on the size effect and take advantage of that and construct these three-dimensional um, electrodes, and then be clever about how we choose the electrolyte such that the distance, the diffusion distance is minimized. 
Um, I think there's some breakthroughs that can be made uh, in terms of the battery technology um, innovation. And certainly now with the understanding of how to better suppress uh, the lithium uh, dendrite growth, uh, we're really uh, trying to tackle this problem of making them safer in addition to lighter and more um, energy dense. Great. And um, sorry, if I could just chime in one, uh, one more thing. What I'm also hoping to show is this confluence of the communities. So it seems to me, or what I discovered from my, uh, from my own uh, experience, is that up until maybe last year or a couple of years ago, the energy community was very disparate from the nanomechanics community and from the chemistry community. So it was disappointing to see how I would go to battery conferences and I would see a lot of my colleagues in the batteries field but there were very few colleagues that, for example, from the nano science field, or I would go to the ACS conference and there were a lot of the chemistry and electrochemistry colleagues, uh, but they weren't really so involved even in the real batteries research, so to speak. Uh, so I, I found that integrating us together uh, is actually a very useful and very um, um, enjoyable and also successful process. That's really what's going to uh, allow us to solve some of these problems is that bringing us all together and learning to speak each other's language. And so already at the Gordon, so I've presented this work, this uh, MRS uh, bulletin uh, work at a Gordon research conference. Remember back when conferences were a thing? And uh, my students have presented this work at the MRS conference, of course. And uh, it's just wonderful to see that people are starting to say, oh, so all that actually is all related to one another. And I think that this is um, this is the way forward, is to bring us all together. That's excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julia. So with that, I want to congratulate you and your team again on publishing this very interesting work. Um, and um, also special congratulations, of course, for publishing the very first MRS Bulletin Impact article. This is a um, very special occasion, and we couldn't have, it couldn't have been a better author um, than you. So thank you, uh, Julia. Aww. for um, for, for that and, and also for, for taking the time today to speak with us. Um, and um, for more news, visit the MRS Bulletin website at mrsbulletin.org and follow us on Twitter at MRS Bulletin. Thank you for listening.